So now we have a socket, we are going to talk about what we're going to do with it, right? So the socket basically functions at this level. Your application is saying, make me a socket, which is sort of this endpoint, and then the connect actually connects to an application on the far side. And there's a port involved, so that might be port 80. And this, this is the far host, and that could be www.py4e.org or data.py4e.org. Okay, and so the socket is solving this, and, and the question then is, what are we going to send and what are we going to expect to get back? And that's what we call the application protocol. So we know that these two have made a phone call. And it's no different than making the phone call and saying, you know, hello, right? And uh, everyone knows that when you, the phone rings and you pick it up, you're supposed to say hello. Uh, and that's part of our protocol. So who talks first, right? So the dominant protocol that we use on this in this section is the HTTP protocol. It's the key is hypertext transport transfer protocol. It's dominant. It's really easy to use. That's why I use it as an example, but realize that there are many others like mail and file transfer and remote login and all kinds of other protocols. Each is a different application protocol. They all use sort of sockets at their lower level, but then on top of that, they layer the rules of the road for retrieving uh, hypertext web pages. And we have used these for all kinds of other things. So the protocol, like I said, is like who answers the phone first? What do they say? What happens if the person doesn't answer right? Can you hear me now? Those kinds of things. And it's a real simple thing. And, it, and all you really need to do is so that both sides can agree, you have to write a thing that's like the rules in the middle and say, okay, everybody, as long as we all do this, we'll be fine. It's as simple as picking on which side of the road the cars can drive on. It works fine no matter which side, but if each car randomly picked, it would be really kind of a mess. So if you look at the typical URL, and this is one of the things that uh, the web innovators in 1980 uh, really invented that was wonderful, and, and it seems second nature today, but in 1990 it was rather revolutionary, and that these uniform resource locators encrypted included in themselves a protocol, the host to connect to, and the document to retrieve. So this is one of the clever clever ideas that the web came up with because we used to have to pick a program like FTP or Telnet or whatever, SMTP, then we had to go to the right host and then we had to talk to that host a certain way. So in HTTP, it's a really simple protocol invented in 1989 and 1990 by Tim Berners-Lee and Robert Caillou at, the World, at, the, uh, <clears throat> at CERN. And uh, they created a protocol that we have grown to know and love and use for way more than retrieving documents, as we'll see in the upcoming chapters. So we're going to talk a little bit about what happens when you click on a page that has a link. Now, there's all kind of fancy stuff that can go on, but this is the basics. And so let's just imagine for the moment you start sitting looking at a web page, drchuck.com slash page one, and inside that there is a hyperlink. It is a indication that says when you clicked on this page, go to a different page. And in that you see the name of the page that you're supposed to go to. So we click on this link and that is a browser. This is an application. This is a process or an app that's running on your computer. This is the browser, okay? And when the browser sees the click inside your computer, then the browser makes a connection to port 80 on the web server, drchuck.com, and sends the request. This request that it sends is precisely specified by a standard, which we will see in a second. Then the web server does some magic work. Oops, let's go back. Then the web server does some magic work in here, reads some files, runs some code, does whatever, constructs an answer to our phone call, and sends it back. And it sends, in this case, back a web page in the format of HTML, the Hypertext Markup Language, which is different than HTTP, which is the protocol that we're exchanging. HTML is the format of the document we're getting back. And in this has an anchor tag, href, and the end of anchor tag, and some highlighted text. And now your, your browser gets this back and then renders it according to the rules of HTML and CSS and JavaScript, etc., parses it, and then makes a pretty web page. And this web page happens to have a link back to the first page, and if you click there, it will do this over and over and over again. And that is the request response cycle. And that's governed by a series of internet standards. These are standards that were built in the, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and continue to this day 
brought by a group called the Internet Engineering Task Force, or IETF. Uh, the documents they produce are called RFCs, which stands for Request for Comments. The RFC, the word RFC is kind of like a, a, a sort of joke, as it were. It's a, uh, it's, uh, um, they're, they're trying to be kind of funny in that, uh, funny is not the right word. They're, it's, it's ironic in that they're trying to say, even so in the protocols of the internet that we've used for several decades, they're always interested in improvements. And that's what the RFC stands for. And they're all named RFC dash whatever. And if we were going to cruise around, we could find some various RFCs. And this is RFC 2616. Um, there, it might have been revised since then. But this is like a document. And this is what they look like. Hypertext Transfer Protocol version 1. And so you're reading this document. You're going to write a browser. And you want to talk to the application protocol that is HTTP. This is one of many documents that helps define what HTTP is. So if you look down and look down and said, oh, here's what a request looks like. This is how I'm going to get a, get a document from the server. And you keep reading and you keep reading. And it says, um, you're supposed to have the request method with a space, with the request URI, the request method with a space, with a URI, with a space, the HTTP version, and the carriage return to line feed. That's what it's saying. And so it looks kind of like this, right? We say get the document followed by a space. There's got to be one space. You do two spaces. And it's going to be quite frustrating, okay? And so this is an example that you can run on uh, a number of uh, on, on Linux operating systems and Win uh, Macintosh operating systems with no changes. If you install Telnet on your Windows box, you should be able to run something like this as well. So Telnet is a, a program that we used in the old days. Um, it used to be how we logged into servers, but because it doesn't encrypt your data back and forth, we don't use it anymore. But it, it basically is a program that can open a socket to a host on a port. And I'm saying Telnet to this host on port 80. And at this point, I am connected. And whatever I type on my keyboard is going to be sent to that server. Now, if you're doing this, you probably want to cut and paste this really fast. Uh, because if you take too long, most web servers will be like, you're a human. I don't want to talk to humans, I want to talk to programs. So remember to type this fast enough, and then you have to hit enter twice. So you have to have a blank line here. Just type this exactly as it's shown, and then you will get back the server. If you do it right, the server, and the server is properly configured, the server will give you back some headers. And this is metadata about the document you're going to get. It has a blank line, and then the actual document and then the connection is closed. And so if you do this, you can set this up in a way that you can run this on your own computer and in effect hack the, through the back door a web server. Now you can't hack the secure web servers and mail servers it used to be easy to hack, but they're harder to hack now because they challenge you for information. But part of the reason I'm so obsessed with the command line is this is how real hackers work and they know how to talk some of these protocols more directly and so we think of this beautiful sophisticated application talking to some other thing and it's all pretty and we got wonderful clicky buttons and nice usability but the reality is like in the matrix reloaded here uh, the kinds of things that really talented hackers are doing uh, use command lines and um, and they really know what's going on and that's how they do it. They understand what's going on better than the developers of the computers that are trying to be resistant to the hacking. So I come from a long line of using the command line and that's why I encourage you to use the command line in this course. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go up into the application layer and instead of typing those commands by hand, we're going to actually send them from Python and write a very simple Python web browser.